um, is away in Bala preaching at the moment. So we'll be praying for him. But please do, over the course of this next month, think about and hold the students in your prayers. They're going to be coming back over the next few weeks or maybe coming for the first time. And there's some even in this church who are leaving for university as well. So we will hold them in prayer. So let's come together before God. Let's pray now. Heavenly Father, thank you for truth. Thank you that you have given us your word to believe in, to trust, and to live by. Thank you that there is certainty in this. And Lord, thank you that you give us your word, but give us your spirit too, to bring it alive to us, to hone our hearts according to it, to help us to love it and submit to it. Heavenly Father, thank you for the things that we believe that are summarized in the creeds. Lord, thank you for the creeds and confessions which help us to articulate what we believe, to know what it is that we are worshiping when we come in prayer, when we come and sing and read your word and hear your word explained. Lord, thank you for this. Thank you that there is um, a responsibility for us to take out your word, Lord, thank you that you do save, but you use Christians to take out the word that changes. Heavenly Father, thank you for UCCF and for all the organizations that take out your word to students up and down the UK. Heavenly Father, thank you for, for students who are going for the first time. Father, we pray for those even from this church who are going. You might be feeling nervous, anxious about going to a new place, having to make new friends, not knowing people. Heavenly Father, be with them. Help them to, to get settled in quickly, to find their new rhythm. Heavenly Father, thank you for the Christian unions. Lord, may they be places of peace and rest for the Christians who go to them, where they can forge deep friendships and relationships with each other. Oh, Lord, even more, use them. Use the Christian unions and use the students in them for your kingdom. Lord, spread your kingdom. Spread your word through your students. May the witnesses that they bear be true and be complete. Heavenly Father, help them to live out the gospel as well as to preach it. Help them to be witnesses through their lives, in their flats, with their course mates. Lord, give them boldness. Give them confidence. Give them a willingness and a desire to speak for Jesus, we pray. Heavenly Father, um, we know that revival is possible. Uh, and we know that Christian unions have been big and strong in the past and at other times a week. Heavenly Father, use them, whatever their state is, up and down this country, especially in Cardiff, for your glory. Heavenly Father, for our young people, Heavenly Father, we commit them to you. As they start on another semester of, of Friday nights of the youth club. Heavenly Father, bless them. Help them to find uh, a place where they can enjoy and have a good time, but also where they are fed your word. Lord, build them up in truth, we pray. Lord, for that end, um, bless Johnny as he comes and, and, and takes over. Heavenly Father, give the, the team um, a willingness and a desire to serve and to forge relationships here. Heavenly Father, thank you for Connor. I thank you that you've brought him here. Once again, that we can pray for him after his first week here. Lord, how kind you are, how faithful you are. Bless him and bless Karis too, we pray. And Lord, as well as, as matters here, we do think of those further afield. Heavenly Father, for conflicts around the world, especially where your church is persecuted, we are one church. We bleed when they bleed. We, we love when they love. Heavenly Father, be with churches in the Middle East, in India and Bangladesh, and in Nicaragua too. Heavenly Father, help us to, to know how to pray for them. Help us to be able to hold them in our hearts because we are related to them through adoption with you. Heavenly Father, help us to love as you love. Lord, help us to do that even for those um, that we know, for those who are sick and grieving. Heavenly Father, for those people here who are like that, or for people who would love to be with us in person, 
but are listening online. Father, be with them. Put your arms around them. Make your presence known, your spirit felt. Father, thank you that, that we don't need to invite your spirit in, but he is already here in each of our hearts. Heavenly Father, tune our hearts as we hear your word. Bless Sam as he comes to open it up. Inspire him with um, the words through his preparation. And as he looks out at us, help him to know that his, um, his sermon, his, his words are not his words, but your words. Lord, that truths that echo from the dawn of time are still relevant to us today. Lord, convict us of that. Change us, we pray. Heavenly Father, help us this week, this month, to be able to worship you truly in, in times when we're alone as well as times when we're together. Lord, help us, build us up as one, give us fellowship after the service today, uh, and may all our worship of you be acceptable. In your Son's name, amen. 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 Before Sam does come to speak to us, we're going to sing again, Speak, O Lord, as we come to you. Well, good morning. It's lovely to see you. Uh, please do have your Bibles open at Romans chapter 10, that passage that, that Dan read to us earlier on. We're meeting this morning as God's people to worship him, as God's people have done through the ages and the world over. Uh, Dan prayed for them. Our brothers and sisters, we're one in the Lord. Some of God's people have already met today. Others are just uh, rising and getting ready. And we're part of a global church, aren't we? Uh, and a church that stretches through the ages. And as we begin this morning, I want to tell you about two church services 
that took place in the past. The first was a long, long time ago. Um, it's a Sunday morning in the Mediterranean. So the weather's not really like this there, is it? Um, there's a, imagine a cool breeze just blowing through your nice villa. You can picture it, can't you? You long to be there. Uh, the year is about 300 AD. And a woman named Monica is getting ready to go to church. Her family grew up with idols in the house, worshipping other gods. But one of her friends that she interacted with at the market every single day, her life had changed. She'd seen it. It had happened to her. And she'd asked her, how, what has gone on in you? And Monica had heard incredible, life-changing news, all about a saviour, somebody who'd lived a life like hers, a saviour who could pay for her sins, and a saviour who could offer hope for the future. And Monica has believed, and she wants to be a disciple of this saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. And the first step for her as a disciple the first step for her as she follows after the Lord Jesus is to go through the waters of baptism. And this Sunday morning, the church is gathered. And Monica, her, verse, her voice is slightly shaky as she answers the questions that are posed to her. Christian, what do you believe? I believe, she says, in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And she stands in the water and she's plunged beneath it and rises up again. And she says uh, for a second time, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. And at that, she's plunged beneath the waters again. And as she rises, she says, I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. And the words are on her lips, and she's plunged beneath the water for a third time. And she rises up and out, and she's welcomed into the arms of the church and into her new life in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's at one and the same time an incredible moment and an utterly mundane scene, isn't it? vast majority of us, I suppose, will have washed this morning. Um, this woman's washed in water, dried off, and the church has obeyed the Lord Jesus' parting command in Matthew 28. Therefore, go, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Monica has stepped into her new life, and the words that she's used to shape this experience with the words of the Apostles' Creed. And then if you fast forward, uh, the best part of 1,700 years, it's 2016, and I am in Malaysia. I'm visiting family for the first time as an adult. I've taken Esther to some of the sites that I remember from my childhood visits. We go to a place called Keklokse Temple. Um, it's on the island of Penang, and it's the biggest Buddhist temple in Malaysia. And the temple sits high on the hill. And around the temple complex, there are plants and there's all sorts of buildings. And there's idols covered in gold. There are ornate carvings. There are prayer wheels and flags all about. We're there on a Saturday evening. It's about five o'clock. And the drums of the monks are starting to beat as they call one another to the worship of false gods. And I find within myself, for the first time in my life, an indignation that people would dare to worship anyone other than the triune God, the one who made these beautiful plants, the one who imagined the color gold, the one who made human beings in his image. And the people around me are giving themselves over to idol worship. But I find this strange confusion rising in me. If I were born here like my father, would this have been my lot? Who am I? And the following morning, S and I go to the closest church that we can possibly find. It's one called St. George's. And we sit in the pews. And at the start of the service, something very similar happened to the start of this service. We're invited to confess our faith using the ancient words of the Apostles' Creed. Christians, what do you believe? And I get to answer I believe in God, the Father Almighty. These are the same words 
yeah, in another language, but the same words that God's people have been using since Monica and co. all those years before. And as I confess my faith, I know a deep reassurance and peace about who I am. I know that whilst I'm bound to these people on the island of Penang by blood, there's a binding and belonging to another group of people that is eternal. I know that I believe and trust in a God who is a creator, a savior who uh, has kept me, an indwelling friend of the Holy Spirit. I know and I'm reassured I have a sure and certain hope for the future. And it was a huge comfort for me to be able to take these words on my lips and to own them for myself that morning. And these words of the Apostles' Creed, they've been taken on the lips of God's people on Sundays the world over and through the ages. We've joined them this morning, haven't we? And we see in Monica's experience and in my experience, one of the key things that the Apostles' Creed is able to do. The Creed helps us to grow it roots us. The creed helps us to grow and it roots us as it teaches us the things that are important and the building blocks and the foundations of our faith. The very name points to this, doesn't it? The Apostles' Creed, it's called the Apostles' Creed, not because the Apostles wrote it, but because it's the summary of the Apostles' teaching and it gives us a foundation and the ABCs of what we believe. The early church formed it and shaped it and it was initially used, uh, like we heard from Dan, as a teaching tool as well. And it was used for baptisms as a starting point for our life in Christ. But here's the thing. The place that each and every single one of us starts in the Christian life is a place that we've got to stay. You get the treasures at the very beginning, and they're the, what we need to know in order to grow. It can sound confusing, can't it? Because Sometimes the Bible describes um, our life in Christ as a race, moving forwards toward a destination. But in other places, we read about it being more botanical, don't we? More agricultural. Our life in Christ is like being planted and rooted and growing, not as bamboos, but into great oak trees, strong and firm, places uh, of life, uh, a place of shade for the people, a place where there is fruit to be enjoyed. And so it makes far more sense that the place that we begin is a place that we stay. As a seed of the gospel falls into the soil of our hearts, it germinates and shoots upwards. And the Apostles' Creed is like fertilizer for it to grow. But there have been some people uh, who um, view this and all creeds with suspicion. Some people who, who raise objection to the creeds. They're good, sincere, uh, honest Christians who want to make sure that we trust in God's Word and know me a tradition. They might say something like, well, we have no creed but the Bible. And there can be a temptation to reject the creed as part of worship because it's written by people. And let's be clear, as we start this series this autumn, we're not preaching the creed, neither are we saying that it's authoritative, but we, treat, we preach God's Word, the Bible. And that's the, the truth that the creed points to. I heard a really uh, helpful illustration about that this week. That the creed's a bit like the moon. Uh, maybe as you've walked home from prayer meeting or home group or one of the wine wham sessions in the last week or so, uh, you know, it's been after sunset, hasn't it? And the nights are starting to draw in. But it's not pitch black, is it? Even though the sun has set. Yes, there are street lights and starlights. But one of the most consistent sources of nightlight for us is what? The moon, isn't it? But here's the thing. The moon's got absolutely no light of its own, has it? All it is is a hulking great rock in space. All it does is to reflect the light of the sun to us. And in the same way, the Apostles' Creed, it's got no power or authority of its own, but it reflects to us true power and authority, truth that's found in God's Word, the Bible. Yet there is a helpful illumination that comes to us from this ancient document. And it's our hope and prayer that as we spend this next term thinking about the truth of God's Word that the Apostles' Creed points to, we're going to be shaped and formed. We're going to grow as the light of God's Word shines on us. 
that we'll be reminded of who we are. And as we go back to the foundations, we'll be comforted and challenged and encouraged as we get to confess our shared belief. And this morning, we're going to think about the very start of the creed, the very first two words, in fact, I believe. And we're going to be in Romans 10. And specifically, we're just going to look at one verse, in fact, verse 9. Let me read that to you again. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. There are two things that God's word is calling us to this morning. As we say that, I believe, this is what we're going to see from Romans 10 verse 9. Declare truth with your mouth and believe truth in your heart. Declare truth in your mouth, believe truth in your heart. So let's think about that together. Let's think firstly, declare truth with your mouth. Just look at verse 9, will you, of Romans 10. Look at the way verse 9 works. What's the first word? It's an if, isn't it? If you do this, then something's going to happen. And there are two things that the if tells us to do in the verse. And there's a promise that accompanies it. What's the promise? If we're able to do these two things, we will be saved. And here's the first if. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. Well, truth needs to be declared. We need to uh, make sure that we're saying true things. And truth matters, doesn't it? And declare, in declaring truth, there is power. The Apostle Paul, he gives us a very concise statement of truth just here, doesn't it? A concise creed, if you will. And it's the words that each one of us are greeted every time we walk through those doors, isn't it? It's the words that are emblazoned above my head. They are, these are symbolically framing everything that we do and all that we are as minister. Jesus Christ is Lord. And you know what? This creedal statement is not the only example that we find in the Bible. Just listen to the start of 1 Corinthians 15. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, and on which you've taken your stand. By this gospel, you're saved. If you hold firmly to the word I preached to you, otherwise you believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and it appeared to Cephas and then to the Twelve. Paul reminds the Corinthians, doesn't he, of the things of first importance that he passed on. And verse 3 to 5 seemed to be already in use. It would be familiar to the Corinthians to be used as a, as a confession, as a creed, to declare faith, the way that they're structured, they're parallel lines in order that, that points us to this. And these key truths need to be declared. And in, in declaring truth in this way, we're guarded against the terrible temptation and bias that we have to wander away from the truth. You know, each and every single one of us, we've got hearts like uh, long green bowls. You know, the, the big stones that you see, um, generally speaking, or older people dressed in white rolling down the, 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 the uh, lawns, don't we? We don't roll straight and true, but we're bound to swing toward the left or toward the right. And so, creeds guard us when we declare truth in this way. Dan pointed out already how that works. And you know, it's not so much that truth needs to be guarded. Truth needs no defense in and of itself, does it? Truth can happily stand on its own two feet. Truth is like light. It shines in the darkness. And darkness doesn't overcome it. But you and me, we're of a different category. We're in a different boat. We can very easily have the wool pulled over our eyes, can't we? Have you ever fallen for a scam? terrible feeling to be caught out. And the higher the stakes, the worse it can feel. So, matters of eternal fate are of huge significance. You know, one of my favorite Tom Hanks films is uh, Catch Me If You Can. 
Have you seen this one? It's one of those films that if I see it uh, on, it doesn't matter how far through it is, I will leave it on the telly, and I'm, I'm, I'm dialed in. Um, uh, Leo DiCaprio plays Frank Abagnale Jr. He's this teenager at the start of the film who's a prolific forger. He starts off by walking into a new school term and pretending to be the substitute teacher and pretending that he uh, is running the classroom and he starts pulling a, um, a salary as well. And things grow and grow and grow. And Tom Hanks goes after him. He's on the run from him. Thing is, how do you catch forgeries? That's what the film's all about. How do uh, people who work in banks not get caught out? How do people behind tills not get uh, tricked by uh, fake cash? Their job's on the line, isn't it? Well, what they need to do, they need to be aware of what gen uh, generally forgeries look like. But the key thing to do is to study the genuine thing as closely as possible. Spend all your time poring over genuine banknotes, genuine checks, the genuine article. Um, focus on the real thing. And in declaring truth and going back to basics, we're familiarizing ourselves with wonderful truth. And in doing so, we guard ourselves. We guard ourselves. And equally, there's another benefit in what we do when we declare truth. And we can uh, be encouraged, those of us who've come this morning, especially those of us who are battling with the circumstances we find ourselves in. Those of you who are beaten down by life, who've really struggled to get out of bed this morning and face the day. Those who find faith as well, an uphill battle. Hear God's words to you this morning and take it up. Declare truth with your mouth. It's a thing about truth, isn't it? Truth and facts have got no regard for feelings. They stay the same regardless of what's going on in our lives. And the ability to declare truth in the midst of darkness is a wonderful gift for those people who are really struggling. As you take these words on your lips, as you declare truth, as you say, I believe... Let me invite you to do so in defiance of your feelings. Your confession of faith is a way to challenge the dark clouds that are overhead. Even though it feels like you're getting completely, well, metaphorically drenched, maybe physically as well. You, in confessing your faith, the faith saying, I believe, you know that there is sunshine on the other side. There is a truth. I'm going to declare the truth of it. And instead of trying to grasp for um, truth that feels uh, beyond the words uh, that you're able to form, the words of the creed can be our words when we feel just lifed out. Like the Apostle Paul, you can know what it is to be hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. I believe. Take these words on your lips. In the midst of these circumstances, declare truth with your mouth. It guards you, and it encourages you. But, but, is it enough to save you? Is it enough to save you? Remember, there are two parts to the if in verse 9 of chapter 10, we need to do more than just declare truth if we want to be saved. You know, imagine, imagine if uh, there was the only first part of the if. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, you'll be saved. Imagine if we managed to squish that verse together. Imagine if Romans 10 verse 9 had the second if part abandoned. You know, evangelism outreach would be a walk in the park, wouldn't it? <laughs> All you need to do is just take a, a, a piece of paper around and get people to kind of hold it up and just read this out. It'd be, they'd be golden. Just say the magic words. You know, there'd be no, no need for other words on the screen, would it? We'd rock up together, say, Jesus Christ is Lord, and then we could go home, couldn't we? That'd be it. We must declare truth, yes. But just to declare truth, it's not sufficient. You know, there is a certain group in the Gospels, and the Gospel accounts, 
who are incredible at declaring truth, yet they are certainly not saved. Far from it. The group who are probably the best and most accurate in declaring truth, especially about the Lord Jesus in the Gospels, the ones who get it straight away, far sooner than anybody else. Remember who they are? It's the demons, isn't it? Straight away in Mark 1, we hear these words. What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. You heard one of your friends talking about the Lord Jesus being the Holy One of God. You'd be thinking, oh, they're on the right track, wouldn't you? Later in Mark 5, we hear these words. What do you want with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? What an incredible confession that is. That's an, uh, a clear acknowledgement of truth, isn't it? You know, the demons are on the money. They are declaring truth in a way that, you know, what we should aspire to. But these demons are, stand utterly opposed to the truth. And so we come to the second thing that we need to see in Romans 10 verse 9. Yes, declare truth with your mouth, but also believe truth in your heart. Believe truth in your heart. If you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Here's a, a word of reassurance for everybody who comes on a Sunday, for the people who are part of Minster. You know what? There's not going to be any tests or exams here anytime soon. Some of you have just finished a period of exams and others of you haven't um, you know, had to sat, sit one for many, many years. And virtually all of us rejoice at that, don't we? And there's no tests lurking uh, about what we know. And as we think about what it is to say these two words at the start of the creed, I believe, we need to see that there's a difference, isn't there, between knowing and believing. They're two different things. So let me prove that by, by telling you something. Exercise is really good for you. If you go for a run, you'll feel better. It's really good for your joints. It's really good for your waistline. And it's really good for your mind. Who, who knows that? <laughs> how, how many of you knew that before I mentioned it? <laughs> to how many of you was that news? But for how many of us has that changed the way that we live? Some of us, yes. I know some of us run very far, but not all of us. We know that we should move more, don't we? But getting a sweat on is just such hard work. And you know what? Donuts make us feel good right away. <laughs> Knowing something doesn't change us. Here's something else. You know, Amazon aren't a particularly nice company, are they? They don't pay their taxes properly. They don't really pay their staff properly. They run other small family firms out of business and are contributing to our high streets dying. Who knows that? How many of you knew that before I told you? For how many of us does that change the way that we live? Some of us, but not all of us. You know, knowing something does contribute to our formation. But just knowing something, it's not enough. We've got to take it from our heads to our hearts. We must believe also. So what is it then? What is it to believe? If you kind of took a straw poll of, of people around us, some people uh, that you come across might think of belief a bit like this, almost closing your eyes and taking a step, a step in the dark, jumping out into the void. And you know what? If that were to be the case, our creed, our series on the Apostles' Creed, would finish it this week, wouldn't it? It'd be just, I believe, and there'd be darkness. There'd be nothing else. But belief is different to that. It's not closing your eyes and stepping, is it? In fact, you go into belief with eyes open. Belief starts with knowledge, but it never stops there. It's always more. To believe, well, it's to trust. It's to rely upon. It's to give everything you are over to another. And so you must believe in an informed way. 
It's a seeing and acknowledging and then acting and living. Back to verse 9. What do you need to do in order to be saved? Believe in your heart that God raised the Lord Jesus from the dead. This is the invitation. It's to put your trust in the God who is seen in the face of the Lord Jesus. Is this God someone that you can rely on? Is this Lord Jesus someone that you can give yourself over to? Who is he? He's the one who died and rose again. And this is significant as it cuts to the heart of one of our problems with our own hearts. Because our hearts are pretty lousy at trusting, aren't they? I said earlier how it's a relief that there are no tests or exams at Minster. And that's really good because most of us are that great at believing. Most of us aren't that great at trusting God. We find it far easier, don't we, to, to trust in the things that we can see and the things that we can trust, uh, uh, the things that we can touch, the things that we can physically lean on. You know, if you manage to bag yourself a 10-year fix on a low-interest mortgage, life is set. Got a ring on your finger, you're going to be fine. If you manage to get a senior job title prefix, you're on the right, right track. If you have a devoted family member to take care of your household as you age, you'll be fine. If you're getting all clear in that last round of blood work, you're golden. And all of these things are good gifts from God. You know what? They're terrible things for us to pin our hopes on and to put all of who we are and all of uh, our lives on. They're too flimsy to hold us. But it's a struggle, isn't it? Not to pin our hopes and our happiness on these things. So this morning, here again, as God's Word calls you to believe truth in your heart, be reminded that it's not how good you are at believing. If you ask, how do you believe? You've already started off on the wrong track because you're asking the wrong question. It's not how. It's who you believe that matters. I believe in God. And this God raised the Lord Jesus from the dead. All of the obstacles that have put, have put in the way for us to flourish in life. Greatest of all, our sin and death itself. Our God has overcome the object of our faith. The person that we trust, he is utterly trustworthy. It doesn't matter how you believe, it's who you believe. In fact, the Lord Jesus himself made this point, didn't he? How much faith do you actually need? It's not so much a teaspoon, it's what's on this teaspoon. I don't know if even the people in the front row can see it. See that? That's what it is. It's a mustard seed. That's as much faith as you need. And that is saving faith. It's nothing, is it? There's nothing to it. Because our hearts are terrible at trusting. But there is someone who is strong enough, big enough, trustworthy enough to save you. And it matters who you believe. All you need is a speck of faith. Belief as much as a mustard seed. And that is enough. The Lord Jesus is the one who will save you. Declare truth with your mouth. And then believe truth with your heart. Will you? Will you believe? Let's have a moment to reflect on what God's Word has called us to do before we sing in response together. Loving Heavenly Father, many of us have come this morning with the storm clouds of life surrounding us. We feel beaten down, yet in defiance of our feelings and defiance of our circumstance, this morning we want to confess again, we believe, we trust in you. Our trust is faltering 
and failing. Our hearts are really bad at it. No matter how long we've been trying to do this, we're so grateful that all it takes is a mustard seed, a speck of faith. Yet we trust in you. And we want to, this morning, abandon all other hope and rush to you. Will you please hold us? Will you keep us? As shaky as we feel, as beaten down as we feel, we want to confess our faith in you again. Keep as we ask, Heavenly Father, as we throw ourselves relying wholly upon you, as we pray in and through the name of our Savior, the one who rose from the dead. Amen. Let's stand uh, as we come to a close now. We're going to sing um, a song that picks up on uh, the statement of the creed, God the Father now. Let's stand together. Let's close our time together with the words of the grace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Well, please don't rush off. Um, it's lovely to have you if you've been here for the first time. Uh, please do stick around. There'll be uh, time for a, for a drink and then uh, listen out for more instructions. Uh, food will be uh, along in due course. God bless you.